Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I have a very special guest um, today that has joined us, Gary Shiner, who is the owner and clinical director of integrateddiabetes.com. I will just read um, his, his bio to you, but his experience and expertise extends way beyond his biography. Gary is an award-winning certified diabetes educator, master's level exercise physiologist, and he also happens to have type one diabetes since 1985. Gary has dedicated his professional life to improving the lives of people with insulin dependent diabetes. He, in 2014, he was named Diabetes Educator of the Year by the American Association of Diabetes Educators, which is a huge honor and testament to his expertise. He also has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Washington University in St. Louis and a Master in Science in Exercise Physiology from Benedictine University. He received his diabetes training with the world-renowned Jocelyn Diabetes Center, which some of you may be familiar with. Gary also serves on the faculty of many organizations such as Children with Diabetes. He's an active volunteer for the American Diabetes Association, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, Diabetes Sisters, and Setbay Diabetes Camps. He also serves on the clinical advisory boards for several diabetes device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies. Gary has authored six books. You Can Control Diabetes, Think Like a Pancreas, which I recommend to everyone after they're diagnosed and people come to me and they say, what should I read? It's a must read. Um, the Ultimate Guide to Accurate Carb Counting, Get Control of Your Blood Sugar, until there's a cure, practical CGM, and diabetes, how to help, as well as dozens of articles. Gary is quoted often, frequently, all the time in many diabetes articles as well, and he's also published many scientific ones. Um, he also speaks to local, national, and international conferences on a multitude of topics in diabetes care. He's certified to train on all models of insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, and hybrid closed loop systems. And he has personally used every system that is currently on the market. You cannot get any, any more better expertise than that. Gary's also a devoted husband and father of four, and he enjoys exercising, especially basketball, bicycling, running, and weightlifting, and cheering on his local Philadelphia sports teams. Um, he is with us right now live in um, Pennsylvania. And we are so happy that you're here, Gary. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for that intro, Pam. I sound like a legend in my own mind when you put you it You are way. a legend. Are you kidding me? Not sound like you are a legend. I have your book right here. And I, like I tell everyone on the call, it's just, I can't express this enough. And I tell everyone that this book changed my life, which actually I should say changed Aaron's life and probably saved his life on a few times. Um, when my son was diagnosed, and that was back in the days when there weren't even really any pediatric endocrinologists here, and I went to the U.S., I got educated, I came back, and all I had was kind of the email um, of the wonderful doctor uh, that educated us, or in his team, and I had nowhere to go, I had no answers, and during the day, it was the middle of the night in the U.S., I had nobody to turn to. And I had seen back in the early days of the internet, someone mentioned this book and I said, well, okay, you know, it won't hurt to get it. And what I found was so much wonderful information. Honestly, in the beginning, sometimes it was too much to take in all at once because you're just digesting the diagnosis, but it was able to really help me have a better discussion and ask kind of the right questions to Aaron's doctor in order to really understand what was going on and really learn more about it. So if you do not have this book, get it and buy all the other ones too, because I'm sure they're equally as amazing. Well, so, the new edition is, is out. It came out a few months ago. Oh, I, don't, I gotta great. get you a copy. Yeah, I have because, an older one, but yeah. I still refer to it. We got to update because the technology keeps changing. Even the medications keep changing and so on. Uh, I saw Aisha's uh, child there with their Dexcom on their arm. I got one yeah. too. Uh, so does everybody here have a, a child with type one or is anybody, any adults with type one in the group? 
I am looking at the attendees. There may be some adults here. Um, I've advertised it in groups where there are some adults. I think most people on the call have a child with type one, but is that one? Yes, I have two children. Yeah, Miriam is our rock star in, in our, our local group here with two children with type one. Um, and okay, Reem, her, sis, her 16 year old sister has it. So kind of all across the spectrum. Um, ah, there we have an adult with type one. Gufran is an adult with type one that's on the call. So, so yeah, we have a, a wide uh, variety of, because type one uh, everywhere. All right, it's great to have a mix. Um, I've had type one diabetes uh, for 35 years now. Uh, I was I was diagnosed. This is funny, and it's, I talk about this in my book a little bit. I was diagnosed in a little town in Texas uh, called Sugarland. That was the name of the town, literally. I grew up there, not Did in Sugar, really? not in Sugarland, but on the that's on the west side of Houston. I grew up on right, the east right. side of Houston, so yes, it is a place. Right. You, you know, sugar, I didn't just I make do. that up. No, you, you can't didn't. make up stuff like that. No, you can't. And, you know, when I was diagnosed, you know, back then, um, you were put on NPH insulin, this long acting, inconsistent insulin and regular insulin, which was your mealtime stuff. You were put on these fixed doses of insulin and you had to make your life conform to that insulin program where you got in big trouble. I mean, your blood sugars would just be dangerously high or low. And that was not easy. I mean, you, you really had to conform your entire life to it. So, you know, my, I hated that so much. I was diagnosed as a teenager and I, I really despised that. So I kind of devoted my life to saying, there's gotta be a better way. Let, let's do it the other way. Let's live the life we wanna live, do the things we wanna do and make the insulin program fit that. So that's what the think like a pancreas concept is all about. Because if we can get our, our insulin in the right amounts at the right times, we can manage this thing pretty darn well. You know, not perfectly, it's not gonna be a fucking non-diabetic ranges, but we can manage it pretty well and uh, be, be successful in all we wanna do. And everyone always, talks about these long-term complications from diabetes. I'm, I'm not so into that. I'm, I'm more into the here and now and what's gonna motivate us and allow us to perform well on a day-to-day -day basis. We all know that you know, glucose levels affect so many aspects of our lives. And our, our energy level, our stamina, strength, speed, but emotionally it affects us, intellectually it affects us. So. When we keep our glucose within a reasonable range day to day, that's, that allows us to feel and perform our best. And that's what it's all about. And if we're doing that, you know, our risk for long-term health problems is going to be minimized. So we only have a certain amount of control over what happens long-term. So I, I don't get too bogged down with that. Um, but I got to tell you, the technology has really improved since, you know, 35 years ago. Um, you know, we didn't have pumps then. We didn't have continuous glucose monitors. The insulin was much slower than what we have today. Uh, to me, you know, pump therapy was a great innovation, but it doesn't hold a candle to these continuous glucose monitors because now we don't just have numbers on a meter. We have contacts. We can see where we're, where we're coming from and where we're headed. And that allows us to, uh, to make much better decisions throughout the course of the day. And I see uh, uh, Aisha's child has a CGM right on his arm. And I've used all the different CGM systems personally. The Dexcom is the one that I, I use 24-7. That, that's my, my go-to. Currently, I'm, I'm running a, it's called a do-it-yourself closed loop system called, called Loop. So this is an app that sits on my phone that takes data from my Dexcom and sends a signal to my insulin pump telling it when to increase and decrease delivery. I still have to announce my meals so that I get a bolus, but it really fills in all the gaps. It takes care of a lot of the between meal stuff and uh, everything I control is right through my phone. So this is not a, a regulated or government approved system. This is a build it yourself kind of system uh, so it takes a little bit of technical expertise to, to do, but it, it works extremely well. 
So the Dexcom is uh, the C, kind of the go-to CGM. Uh, the Libre is something that I've used. And we just got the Libre 2, the updated version, approved in the, in the States. Uh, this is one that you know, traditionally, this didn't give you high or low alerts. You had to scan it and just see what was going on. But the new version will emit the alerts and let you know if you're getting into a dangerous place, which is so valuable for us. We can't undervalue how important that is. I see someone's Dexcom. Hold on. Wait, wait. Oh, hey, there's mine. See? We're blood sugar brothers. Uh, Medtronic um, has had a, they were the first ones on the market with a CGM uh, about 20 years ago. That one didn't even show you your data. It, it just stored it in a box and there was a cable that connected it to the sensor. So that's come a long way. Um, theirs works with their pump and their pump also has what I call a hybrid closed loop feature to automatically make insulin adjustments. And another one that is a little bit newer is called the, the Eversense. This little piece right here actually gets implanted in your body. The doctor makes a little incision in your skin, pops it in, and then it just it tape over it. Um, but that works. The original one worked for three months. We also had a six month and a 12 month version now in Europe. Uh, there's a transmitter that, that sticks on your skin and it sends a signal to a smartphone app. So you don't have to change sensors or transmitters. It's all built into that same little unit. Uh, and the data just shows up on your phone and it's you know, got all the features like the other ones. Question do. about that, because someone asked about ever since in our group just a few days ago. And when they insert it, is it like a procedure? Do they use a local anesthesia or yes. it, local? And is it recommended for children? Uh, well, it's not approved for children at this point. Mm. I mean, it, it varies by country, though. That's that's the tricky part. Uh, but it can be used in kids. It just has to be you know, prescribed off-label by the physician uh, who's willing to do it. Yeah, and you it's need not a available here. Yet. The procedure for the insertion and removal because it has to be replaced every three or ah. six months, depending okay. on the version you have. That is true. It is not approved here yet, and even with Dexcom right now we are still having only the five in the market, but mm -hmm. six is coming. Just sometimes it usually will, things will be released in Europe or in the US first. And then sometimes we get it a year or two later. It just really depends on many things, the regulations, yeah. et cetera. It's like funny because in, in uh, Europe, uh, things like the Libre are ahead of what we have here in the States. They've had, they're on their third generation of Libre already. We're just getting the second now. Oh, wow. Some of the pumps as well have been launched in Europe before they come here. You know, when there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape and bureaucracy, it sometimes slows down progress. I mean, it's, it's there to protect the public, but sometimes they get a little bit too extreme in terms of trying to protect the public and deny or delay us access to things that can be very useful. Yeah. So which one of all of, sorry to interrupt you, of all of those, um, which one has been your, your favorite? Oh, Dexcom, hands down. Dexcom. You know, they all have their, you know, they all have their pros and cons, but overall the Dexcom to me, because of its simplicity, its accuracy, its comfort, I mean, it, it does what I want it to do. It, it really is nice. It, it interferes in my life less than the others do by far. Um, you know, Medtronic still requires multiple calibrations per day on their system. The accuracy is not the greatest and uh, the insertion process is complex and convoluted. Um, the Libre is, it's, it's about as accurate as the Dexcom, at least their latest version is. But it's, it's lacking in a lot of the features that Dexcom offers. I mean, the features really can make or break a system. But you need something that has you know, predictive alerts if you want those, rate of change alerts, definitely the high-low alerts. You know, the high-low alerts for many people is the most important aspect of the CGM. Because I think most of us recognize we don't see our symptoms show up until our blood sugar is in a dangerous place. At the low end, you know, many people don't experience symptoms of hypoglycemia until they're well below a safe threshold. And at the high end, most of us don't feel when our blood sugar is just a little high. 
but if it gets excessively high, we start to feel differently and then we can act on it. But with these sensors, we have the ability to act before we hit those dangerous extremes. So as the glucose is just approaching a low, we can be alerted and then act on it and either prevent the low or minimize how low we get and how long we stay low. So I, I teach my patients, when you, when you get an alert, don't think, just act. Now, it's not the time to be trying to reason with it and figure things out. You get a low alert, you take rapid acting carb immediately. You get a high alert, there's a lot of things you can do. You, know, you can hydrate, you can exercise. Most of us, because we don't have the patience, are just gonna take more insulin. So when we do that, we have to make sure we take insulin on board into account. You know, pumps will figure that automatically, but anybody who's taking insulin injections needs to learn how to calculate their own insulin on board from the previous doses that they took. Um, so I'm just wondering, what's the prevalence of pump use there as opposed to injections? We have, I think, more people on using injections than on pumps, I would say, in this region. Um, pumps you know, can be very expensive, Sometimes insurance doesn't always cover it. So that's a factor. Cost is one thing. Um, also kind of new to new diagnosis. Some, some doctors, not all, some are hesitant to put people on, on pumps right away. Um, and yeah, it, it, a, lot, a lot of the times it comes down to the cost. Um, sometimes, you know, people, like I said, Medtronic is quite prevalent here. Um, my son uses Medtronic and it, it works well for us. And I do like the suspend on low feature. And how I had kind of my wits about me to ask the question when we were selecting an insulin pump when he was very small, I was in the US, but I actually was able to remember to ask, well, what is available to me here? Um, and, and Medtronic has been in the market for, for a long time. Um, a lot of people are using Dexcom with injections. A lot of people are also using Libre with injection. Um, we do have a few other pumps, but people are often bringing them from somewhere else if they're not here yet. Everyone's hopeful that new pumps will be coming because some people don't like, you know, like the idea of having a tube or something connected or you know, many many different reasons. Um, so so yeah, that's kind of the rundown of the market. I don't think you'll find anybody looping here because that would be really uh, kind of illegal to some extent. Um, I did meet one adult though that came to you actually, I think, and set up the, the looping. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's an amazing thing. We're, we're hoping that the, the Medtronic closed loops um, system will, will arrive soon for, for those of us using that and curious about it. But that's kind of where the, the market is right now, but we're hoping that it, it will grow and we'll get the newer versions that you're having as well as different pumps we've not had here. Yeah, the, the uh, hybrid closed loop systems, such as you know, the Medtronic 670 and the 780 that's going to launch shortly. Uh, now we have in the States, we have a company called Tandem that has a similar system that works with the Dexcom sensor. Uh, Omnipod, you know, the little patch pumps, they're about to launch a system with a hybrid closed loop. And we have these do-it-yourself systems, uh, both for Apple and for uh PC users, uh, but what all these systems have in common is that they'll they'll kind of nudge the insulin up and down based on what the situation is. It's sort of like having a, a mom just watching the blood sugar 24 seven and tweaking things every couple of minutes. I know, Pam, you do that anyway, but uh, this, this I way- I think a lot of us on this call do that, yeah, like a mom. That's good. I, I, I'd, I'd love to have a mom <laughs> to do that. And yeah. actually, Gufron on the call says uh, they are currently using the 670G pump and they really like it. It's working great for them so far. So yeah. thanks for sharing that. That's really so, good. You know, that, that nudging of insulin helps to ward off the extremes. It sort of puts guardrails up. So if you're trending up or trending down, it's making adjustments. It's not going to prevent every high or low. You can still go high or low, but it minimizes the uh, intensity of those highs and lows. Uh, you tend to spend more time within your target range. And that, that's an important concept. Being within your acceptable range more often is really important. You know, we're, we're looking at A1C less and less these days. 
we're more, much more concerned with how much time someone spends within their acceptable range. I like to call it a happy zone. You know, it's that blood mm -hmm. sugar zone where you're comfortable. And, you know, it's different for different people, but you have to be liberal about that zone. You can't set it at really tight, narrow ranges because it's not realistic. You need a, a reasonable range to work within. But if you can you know, get at least 75% of your time in that, that happy zone, you're doing an excellent job. As long as you're not having too much time below your zone, we want to minimize that. If it's two, 3%, it's acceptable, but anything more than that gets to be a bit excessive. The CGM is you know, a wonderful tool for helping achieve that. Again, because of those high and low alerts, they give us an early warning that you know, it's like Will Robinson danger, danger. Something bad may happen soon, and you can prevent, you can circumvent those things if you act on them quickly. Um, so that's an important element of any CGM system. Make sure your high and low alert thresholds are set properly. I'm trying to remember, do you guys measure blood sugar in millimole or milligram? It, well, we kind of have a mix here because depending on where people are from or sometimes their devices, they... Mm -hmm they may kind of follow a more UK right, system, I'll, I'll use but terms, you can use both, yeah. So if you, you want to try to keep blood, let's, let's say at the low end, you, you don't want to go below 70 or four uh, on your blood sugar, then you can't set your low alert at 70 or at four. You've got to set it above that level. First off, there's lag time in the system. So when your glucose is falling, the CGM is going to tend to read higher than your actual blood sugar. So if it's, if it's telling you you've gone below 70 or below four, you're probably in the 50 or three range already. So you have to set those low alerts above where you want to catch them. 80, 85, 90, four and a half, th those are reasonable places to set the low alert. By then, you know, if, you, if you drop below that point and take some rapid carb, there's a good chance you can avoid the low entirely. And at the high end, I think this is an area you have to understand or appreciate the, the uh, nuisance factor that goes into all of the high alerts you might get. If you're getting high alerts 20 times a day, you know, you're just going to start to ignore them or you're going to shut it off completely. So you want to set it at a meaningful place. So I, I wouldn't put the high alert at like you know, 180, at 150 or, or 8. I would set that high alert at 200 or 240, you know, someplace where it's going to give you a meaningful message that you're going to be willing to act upon. I, I like to set those high alerts at an acceptable post-meal level. So going into meals, your target is one thing. After meals, we know the sugar is going to rise. So if you want to keep your glucose, let's say, below uh, 200 or below 11 after meals, that might be a reasonable place to put your high alert. So the high-low alerts, that's a key aspect of CGM. Get the settings right and act on them quickly to really benefit. Mm. The other, another thing that's very beneficial with these systems is the trending information. And you know, since the first CGM, you know, real-time CGMs came out, that's been very reliable. When a CGM shows you rising or falling, you can count on that to be true. You know, it's just measuring a signal wavelength. So as your glucose is going up, the signal goes up. And you know, being able to make competent decisions throughout the day, it, it really helps to know what direction you're headed. I, I call it the context of your glucose. If you finger stick and your glucose is, let's say it's, it's 140 or, or, or uh, six or seven, it's, it's great to know, yeah, great, I'm 140 right now, but what does that really mean? Where am I headed? If I'm headed up or I'm headed down, you, you're gonna think differently. You know, it's to me, it's kind of like watching the movie The Godfather. Hopefully, most people have seen that movie, but you know, it's a movie about mobsters. It's these Italian families where you know the, the heads of the men and the family are all they're all mobsters basically. But if all you saw was one scene from the movie, a photograph of Vito Corleone playing with his guy, his grandson in the garden, you'd think, "Wow, it's a movie about you know nice old people." But you watch the movie and you learn what's really going on with this family. That's context. And, and that's what trending information gives us is context. So if you're going into a meal and your glucose is stable, you can take your usual insulin dose based on your carbs, your blood sugar, your activity. You, you figure your dose normally. 
But if you're going into that same meal with a blood sugar that's falling, you got to take that into account. You're either going to need to eat more or take less insulin in order to get the outcomes you're looking for. And if you're rising, you're either going to need to eat a little less than you planned or take a little more insulin to get the outcomes that you want. So your decision making throughout the day can and should be affected by the direction your glucose is headed. So if you or your child is, is about to go to bed and the blood sugar is, let's say it's, it's 100 or around five and a half, you think, oh, that's a great number. But what if it's 100 and falling? You're going to be acting differently. You may have a snack. You might just check again in half an hour to see where it is. But if it's 100 and rising, eh, you might you know, bump the insulin up a little bit. You, know, you may do something a little differently. We can make better decisions all day long knowing what direction our, our blood sugar is headed. The another thing we get in real time are the numbers themselves. We forget sometimes how often we used to have to finger stick. I probably have 35 years that I've done tens of thousands of finger sticks on each finger. You know, it's scary to think about how many we do. The CGM certainly lets us cut back on the need to finger stick, but it doesn't eliminate it. You know, there are situations where you know, even with a CGM that's functioning, you're still going to need to finger stick. There's probably five or six situations where that comes up. I'm curious how many of you can think of a reason to do a finger stick when you're using a CGM. Anybody, feel free to write it in the, the comment. I'm afraid if we unmute, we'll uh, all end up talking at the same time. Can you do a raise hand thing? Oh yeah, is there a raise hand? So some interesting comments here to confirm. Often, in case once a day, oh, high yeah. or low, yeah. To verify the reading. Two per day, if the sensor's okay. You're coming up with some very good answers here. I'll run yeah. through my list. Uh, if, you, if it's a system that needs calibration, obviously you're going to need to finger stick to make sure your system is calibrated properly. On day one of a sensor, when you've changed your sensor, put a new one on, it's always a good idea to do a finger stick on day one, even on a system that doesn't require calibration like the Libre or the Dexcom G6 or the Evers. Day one, you're going to need a, at least one finger stick just to make sure the system's functioning right because the accuracy of the sensors on day one is not always that good. When your glucose is rising or falling quickly and you have to calculate an insulin dose because of the lag time that's inherent in any sensor, when you're rising or falling quickly, the sensor is gonna be off a little bit more than usual. So a finger stick is beneficial if you are rising or falling quickly and need to calculate a dose of insulin. Someone had mentioned if your blood sugar is low. I don't always need, need to finger stick when it's low. However, when you're recovering from a low, you do need to finger stick. And the reason is that when you recover from a low, your sensor may take 30, 45, even 60 minutes to catch on to the fact that your blood sugar has started to come up. And if you trust your sensor when it keeps telling you you're low, 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 and you keep eating and eating and eating, we all know what's going to happen. You're going to wind up ridiculously high. So 15 minutes after you treat a low and your sensor is still saying low, do a finger stick. You've probably risen. The sensor just hasn't caught on to it yet. Yep, I also question. recommend. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, finish, finish that topic and then I'll, I'll get into a question we have. You say with some sensors, you also have to be concerned about medications that might affect the accuracy, like acetaminophen, you know, Tylenol products. It affects most of the older generation sensors. It doesn't affect the Libre, it doesn't affect the Dexcom G6, but it does affect everything prior to that. Vitamin C can affect the Libre, especially when it's taken in higher doses. Uh, and I'm not sure about the Medtronic. I know it's affected by acetaminophen. I don't know about vitamin C. But if you take those kind of medications, you need to finger stick to get accurate numbers. And of course, if your symptoms don't match, I woke up this morning, felt like my blood sugar was kind of high, and my sensor was reading 148, which is like a, it's about a seven and a half, eight. So I did a finger stick just to see what was going on. <laughs> my meters 148 on the nose. I'm thinking, okay, I will. I'm I'm sorry I didn't trust you, but 
Uh, but yeah, clearly, if you don't, if you're not feeling the same as your sensor shows, do a finger stick. So even with systems now that don't require calibration, finger sticks are still necessary and important. And I forgot to even mention when you're in a warm up phase with a new sensor, you need the finger stick then. If you ran out of sensors or your transmitter stopped working, you need the finger stick then. So finger stick readings are still a, a reality. We still need to make them part of our daily routine, but certainly not nearly as often as we used to. So, yeah. Is there a question? Uh, yes, there is a question. Yusuf is asking, um, any thoughts about the new Protex CGM from China, which is CE approved? I have no idea. I don't have any experience with it personally. So until I have a chance to try it myself, I'm not going to comment on it. All of our clinicians at our practice have type 1 diabetes. We've got six clinicians, all have type 1. Our social worker doesn't have type 1, but her son does. So we kind of grandfathered her into the practice. But we all try everything personally. We use them for quite a while and get experience with them before we counsel patients on, on any of these things. It's amazing. I try to try as much as possible before I sell it, like the tape and, and all mm -hmm. of that. So I think that's important and gives you great insight to it. Um, and then there was another question earlier when we were talking about time and range. Miriam had asked, can it be measured for people on MDI? Oh, absolutely. If you're on injection therapy, yeah, you can still look at your time and range. Uh, certainly a, a CGM is a better way to get that information. Uh, but you, if you're just taking finger sticks, you can also calculate your time and range. And what I like to do is, is go through each phase of the day separately. I'll look at all of the fasting finger stick readings and see how many of those were within the acceptable range, how many were below, how many were above. You do that, for, you know, take a month of data and you can do calculate a percentage. Do the same thing for pre-lunch, the same thing for pre-dinner, the same for bedtime, or if any other phase of the day that you routinely do a finger stick, you can calculate how often you're in your target zone. Uh, it doesn't account for what's going on after meals. It doesn't account for what's going on overnight, but at least you get a good sense of how your control looks at each phase of the day. And that's really, that, that's even more important in the overall time and range because I mean, you could have 75% of time in range and have terrible control before lunch. Uh, you might be running high or low a lot. So, you know, one metric like time in range doesn't tell you everything. Personally, I like to look at the, you know, the details, the, the sensors. I look at these overlay reports that kind of superimpose multiple days on top of each other. And that way I can get a, a, a look at what's going on at different phases of the day. You know, are there a lot of highs or lows at certain times? What precedes them? What follows them? It's, it's pretty easy to, to visualize on those overlay type reports. So that, that's really the, the final thing we get out of CGM is we get the ability to analyze data and get a true picture of what's going on. Finger sticks will only give us part of the story. They don't tell us how high we're peaking after we eat. They don't tell us what's going on 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m. during the night, unless you're up doing finger sticks all night. I hope you're not doing, having to do that. Uh, so the, the CGM provides us that the whole, the whole movie, the whole full context. We get the whole Vito Corleone backstory when we're looking at a CGM. That's what's so valuable about it. And yeah, that, that's an area I, I, I really love. And I, I wrote a book, uh, it's mainly for health professionals, but it's about how to analyze sensor data and glean really useful insights out of it. You know, most people are intimidated looking at those CGM reports and they can be complicated to look at, but I find if you break them down into small little chunks, look at specific things at a time, uh, you can gain some valuable insight from them. Amazing. So we should all go out and get uh, get that book as well as we try to navigate through our child CGM thing. And when you were talking earlier about kind of post meals and things like that, and, you know, people love food with or without diabetes and the discussions that you have about food when you have diabetes or you have a child with diabetes go beyond so many different 
things about discussing food that you never thought were possible. Um, and I love that you and your team experiment with the different foods. If you all are not following Gary on social media um, or his or integrated diabetes, you should because he and his team will experiment. They'll all eat like pizza one day and then see who bolused it better or who managed it better or what the results were and what the, the lessons were from it. And it's really super helpful. So could you give us, because this is something we're, we're challenged with a lot, like for example, bolusing for something that's got a lot of fat, like pizza, and especially if you're on NDI with a pump, you can do temporary basils and it makes it so much easier, but I think it's more challenging if you're doing injections. How can we better manage those situations when we're injecting? Well, Monday night, we all did Mexican food. Uh, different versions. You know, we have some of our clinicians, you know, live in the Southwest. They had Tex-Mex, you know, so we had different versions of Mexican food. But that that's another good example where you get these slow digesting carbs, a lot of fat in the meal. Pizza is a classic example as well. The thing people neglect to account for oftentimes is the fat content of the meal. So fat does not turn into sugar. It doesn't convert into glucose. But what it does do is it slows digestion and it causes some degree of insulin resistance. It's kind of like getting type two diabetes for a few hours where you, the insulin that you're getting just doesn't work as well as usual. And this is why if you go out to dinner or get a takeout meal for dinner, your blood sugar at bedtime might be normal or even a little on the low side, and then you rise all night long. That's the fat causing that to happen. So for those on pumps, the, the solution is to use a couple of the advanced pump features. You can extend your bolus. Don't take the whole bolus at one time. You can spread it out over a few hours so that the absorption of the food is matched by the action of the insulin a little better. But then you also have to raise your basal rate through the night to offset the effects the fat is having. So those two tools can be very useful for handling that. If you're on injections, it's, it's a little tougher to manage, but it's not impossible. I always recommend that you know, anyone on injections keep a pen or a vial of regular insulin around because it's very useful for slow digesting meals. So if you're gonna have a pasta meal, which tends to take a while to digest, Instead of taking you know, your rapid insulin, your Humalog, Novalog, Epidra, take regular insulin for a meal like that. The insulin will match the absorption of the carbs much closer. You won't drop and then rise later with insulin that peaks too early. So some regular insulin can work well. If you can't access regular insulin, then consider taking your insulin either in a delayed manner or splitting it into a couple of parts. You could take half your dose at your meal time and half of it a couple of hours later, knowing the carbs are going to take a while to digest. Dealing with the fat is a little tougher if you're on injections because you don't have the ability to temporarily raise your basal for six or eight hours. There, you know, I mean, you could raise your long acting insulin, but now you've changed your insulin for 24 hours or more. To get extra insulin for the next six, eight, 10 hours, you could actually use a little bit of NPH insulin. NPH is an older version of a long acting insulin. It's a cloudy mixture. It takes about four hours to start working and does most of its work in about six to 10 hours. So a tiny bit of NPH insulin can offset the effects fat has later on. And so you can get creative with your injections if need be or you know, figure out a way to go on a pump because now you have some tools within the pump that allow you to manage that a little more effectively. I am not sure, to be honest, that we have any of those other types of insulin um, because the way things are procured here for pharmaceuticals is quite different than in the US and the way we can access them. Um, you know, we do have you know, your typical usual suspects, Nova Rapid um, and Lantus and things like that. But the other insulins, I don't think that those are available. Uh, anybody out there working in pharma industry might would know better than I would, and because I'm not injecting. Um, those are actually cheap insulins, regular and NPH. Here, you can buy them over the counter for 
close to nothing because, <laughs> you know, they're not the preferred forms of insulin. So if you are able to procure them, it probably would be very inexpensive to do so. Okay. Okay. So yeah, people out there might, might have a look and, yeah. and find. But the strategy of, of taking your dose late for the meal or splitting it into two parts, that, that, that can work as well. I'm not sure how you could effectively manage that steady rise over you know, six, eight, 10 hours that the fat causes. That's going to be a, a much more complicated thing to do. But honestly, if it's only once in a while that you experience that, um, you might just say, you know, don't worry about it. You run a little high overnight once in a while. It's not the end of the world. You know, kids got to be kids. Let them enjoy that kind of food once in a while. Um, and you know, if you have a slightly elevated reading you know, one night, a, a couple nights a month, that's not, that's not so bad. Uh, there's a lot worse things that could happen. Yeah, that was really useful advice that I got early on, like the one-off day. And for a lot of the people that, you know, come with the question of, oh my goodness, this high and what do I do with it? And I know those of you out there that have those frustrating days, <clears throat> the rest of their days are amazing, like stellar days. They're really, really, really managing it so well. Um, someone, uh, ah, Mohammed mentioned that NPH used to be subscribed here, but now most healthcare providers use the new long lasting insulin, such as Tracebo or Lantus, Tress and Lantus. It might still be available. The pharmacy may have to special order it, but you might mm, still be able to get yeah. it. Yeah. The same with regular insulin, you may still be able to get it. And then Yas has a question. Um, some patients had experienced frequent sensor loss of Dexcom G5 if they calibrate regular, regularly. Any thoughts on that? Well, the thing about calibrating is it should only be done when it's absolutely necessary. It's a very complicated issue, but you can over calibrate a Dexcom. You know, yeah, twice a day with the G5 is still recommended, but um, I would, other than that, I would only calibrate if there's a significant discrepancy between what the sensor and the meter are showing. And to that end, make sure you're using a meter that's got very good accuracy. There are big differences between accuracies with different meters. But if you've got a finger stick that's pretty close to the sensor, don't bother calibrating. It's not gonna do any good. But if there is a more than 20% difference, then go ahead and enter it in. The thing I found that causes the, big, the most issues with Dexcom accuracy is sensor placement. And the sensors generally work well on just about any part of the body. However, if you are putting a lot of pressure on the sensor, particularly at night, if you're laying on it through the night, that's gonna affect it. You'll start losing data signals. You'll start having what are called compression lows. Uh, these are these are false lows where the Dexcom thinks or the, whatever sensor it thinks you're low only because the the fluid below the skin that interstitial fluid is pushed away from the sensor because you're laying right on it, so it doesn't it thinks your glucose has dropped where there's really just less fluid getting to the sensor, so those kind of fake lows can be avoided by wearing the sensor on a body part that you're not laying on or pressing on a whole lot. Another question came in, how, any way to make the G6 work well <clears throat> in a slim four-year-old who doesn't like to drink water? Yeah. Well, with any, any young child, any slim individual, I recommend putting the sensor on the backside, right on the upper buttocks. That, that's a good spot. Because even lean people have a little bit of a fat pad back there, and that can help it work better. The companies only have quote unquote, approved sites on the body for wearing these, but that's simply because they only tested them on those sites. They didn't test them formally and submit the data to the government using other body parts. It doesn't mean the, sets, the, the sensors don't work well on those areas. It just means they didn't bother collecting the data. I can tell you from experience, they work well just about any place on the body where you have a little bit of a fat pad under the skin. And with lean people and with young kids, the buttocks is a really good place to put the sensors. Nice. Any other questions? Because this is, I mean, this is amazing. And I know we can, we can continue certainly with, with Gary's discussion, but I want to make sure if anyone has any um, questions that they get them in before the top of the hour, because I think you've been answering a lot of the questions on the way. 
as you've been talking. Um, Let me uh, put, I'm going to type my email into the chat because if people do have questions after the fact, they can certainly reach out to me. Sure, that would be great. And while you're typing that, I'll read a question from Zaina. Any ideas other than skin tack recommended for placing on the skin before a G6 Dexcom? We're having some severe infection after a couple of days. Oh, well, skin tack's not going to help with infection. Um, if you're developing infection at the site, you, you've got to cleanse really well. You know, Hibiclens, Betadine, these strong antibacterial uh, cleansing agents, those are what should be used to prevent infection. For adhesion issues, it's a whole different thing. With adhesion, over tapes tend to work better. Uh, you know, Libre is a bit limited in what they offer. And the fact is, with the Libre sensor, there's not a lot of adhesive buffer around the sensor itself. So you may have to you know, cut out your own little hole on that and, and apply it. Dexcom has these over patches that they send for free to anybody who wants them. They have the hole pre-cut. Put this over the adhesive part of the sensor, and it, it really does help. Another one I found very uh, effective are called Rift Grips. Pam, I don't know if you ever used these or not. Those I have not gotten a hold of yet. Right now, we're using Stay Put, and we also sell that here. I've had really, really good results with that because of the humidity, but I've heard really good things about these two. They, they have all these customized designs for the Griff Grips, but what I like about the Griff Grips, it's a cloth tape, so it's stretchy and it moves with your body. The adhesive has, is very gummy, so it doesn't loosen up when you sweat. So if, if adhesion is a problem, this is good to go with. Yeah. If irritation on the skin is an issue, and this can apply to any CGM, any pump infusion set, if you're just having redness, itching, any inflammation where the adhesive is, what I'd recommend is using a barrier. Not a wipe, but a piece of tape, a, a dressing that goes right on the skin, and then you put your sensor or your pump infusion set right through that tape. That way the adhesive for this, the, the sensor or the infusion set doesn't come in direct contact with your skin. The barrier helps pr protect the skin. Um, IV 3000 is a pretty common one that people use. It's a nice hypoallergenic tape, but any kind of like plain paper tape, uh, sports tapes, things like that can work well also. You sometimes have to play around with different ones till you find one that works well. What you can do is a, a, a kind of a tolerance test get a few different adhesives, cut a little square out and stick it on the skin, you know, not with a sensor or a pump attached, just the tape itself and wear that for several days and then peel it off to see if there's any irritation or any redness that shows up. And like Zaina was asking, experiment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Zaina was asking, do you place the grip, gip, uh, grip before under before you place no, the sensor over. or after place, over after you yeah. insert the sensor you put this over the sensor and so it, it kind of holds on to the adhesive part of the sensor and seals it in place yeah and i find things that are really quite gummy it feels a bit strange to put it on but in the weather that we have here in the gcc it's amazing because i've tried a lot of other tapes beautiful tape love it want to love it and it it falls off even without a lot of strenuous activity just because it is so hot and humid here so that one sounds like it would probably be be good for this environment yeah some if you're using uh, some people say that the sensor can get damaged i never see the dexcom but the medtronic can sometimes be damaged in which case you can cut a tiny hole in that adhesive you put on the skin and just the point where the sensor goes through, if you place it carefully, the sensor mm -hmm. won't have to puncture through the adhesive. Uh, and that can save you from potentially damaging or crimping the sensor on insertion. Oh, or when it's under. Um, and then Grufon says, we usually apply kind of the sandwich method, but unfortunately it, it damages the Medtronic sensor as that electrode gets broken when you insert it on a barrier. Yeah, I've never had to do that. We just put it directly in the skin. So, and it's because it's quite small, that part that is is going in. So that would be understandable. Um, okay, any other questions about sensors? 
or tapes or anything related to sensors? Because I've got a few more questions, but. I posted my website as well. <clears throat> uh, anybody who would like some additional coaching, consultation on now, any aspect of your diabetes management and care, reach out. Our team works with people all over the world, just like this, through video, through phone, through data analysis from downloads. So you know, we, we can effectively coach you uh, wherever you happen to be. The time zones sometimes get a little tricky, but we've got patients in Australia and yeah. all over Asia, Europe, we can figure it out. It can be, it can be tricky. Um, so going back to, to food, what is, what for you personally, I mean, I'm sure you've managed it and now you're the expert in all foods, but what did you find kind of initially for you was the most challenging foods until you got it well, all kind of figured it's out? It's funny. I think everyone has their kind of like their kryptonite food that no matter what they do, they just can't get it to work. I really struggle with popcorn. It's one of my favorite foods and I really struggle with it. Uh, and maybe is that it's... movie popcorn? Yeah, yeah, mainly. The micro, the stuff in the back of the microwave is a little easier, but you go out to the movies and get the popcorn. It's got a lot of fat in it. It's got a lot of fiber, so it's slow to digest. Um, so that's that's been a challenge. You know, I've been practicing and trying to get that right for years and I still struggle a bit. Bagels sometimes give me a hard time also. I can weigh a bagel. I can know exactly how many grams of carb are in that thing. Still sends my blood sugar a lot higher than I'd anticipate. So something about bagels. And so here's a maybe a new challenge for you. Uh, have you and your team ever done any Arabic food challenge? We haven't, but that would be, we'd have to find the restaurants around here, but that would be- I bet be you a, there's- I bet you there's some good ones because I, I'm sure there's a, a good uh, maybe Lebanese population in your area or other Arabic population. And I'll for those of you who dietitians have, um, we've got two dietitians on staff who try every kind of food out there. Okay. And I'm guessing they probably have some experience. I don't. Okay. We have an Indian restaurant right near my office, but uh, oh, and we do have a what's it called? We have a one Middle Eastern restaurant that serves up uh, tabbouleh and a lot of hummus type dishes. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, kebabs, a lot of yep. bread, a yep. lot of carbs on the side because those I think sometimes can be can be challenging um, as well. So that, that could be an interesting one as well as Indian cuisine because we have a lot of Indian food here. Um, the beauty of the UAE, we have a lot of different cuisines, but you know, because a lot of the, the published information about carbohydrates and all of these other things is in the, you know, kind of a Western diet. So information about the Middle Eastern diet or Indian diet in, in the context of diabetes can be quite limited. So that would kind of be a fun, a fun challenge that I think a lot of people would, would enjoy. We've yeah, done, people are asking. We're trying to figure out our next challenge. We've done pizza, we've done uh, ice cream. It was specifically, it was Ben and Jerry's ice cream, which I don't know if you guys can get there or not. We can buy it here. Um, I don't think there's any freestanding Ben and Jerry's, but it is in the supermarket. Actually, that was a question to the, the dietitian on the last call. And I think that person is on this call as well. Somebody asked, what is the best time of day to have ice cream? And I said, any time of day, but yeah, when what is, is the best time of day? I think because at night it was causing some challenges with the blood sugar. So is there an ideal time for ice cream? It'll cause the same challenges any time of day, but um, hmm. see if you do it after a meal, you know, you're less likely, you know, like as a dessert, I think you're less likely to get much of a spike, but ice cream, depending on what it is, could be really slow to digest. Um, I don't think there is a better time of day than another. They're all, like you said, they're all good times. What's your favorite yeah. flavor? For me, I'm kind of like vanilla, but anybody? Uh, Liven it up a little. I know, I know, but I do. I'm into homemade ice cream. I love vanilla being a good vanilla or peanut butter. And, and Aaron loves peanut butter, like 
he was like, mom, make peanut butter ice cream, go get Reese's cups and put it in. And I'm like, and already I'm thinking, I'm like, how am I ever going to bowl for such a thing? But yeah, he, he loves, you know, the fat of the peanut butter, which, yeah, which is good. And sometimes that comes in handy. Exercise is different. The time of day you exercise has an enormous impact on a lot of things, but I, I don't know that I don't think the food is going to matter as much. When we know if you eat something first thing in the morning, it's going to tend to digest faster than it will the rest of the day. But I don't see a lot of people just jumping out of bed and eating ice cream, right? Well, maybe Aaron would like to do that if you gave him the option. I'm glad he's not on this call. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are not, I don't think we're going to do that, but I'll keep you posted if we do. One question that, we're talking about breakfast very quickly, um, someone asked a question in the group the other day, their, you know, child has been eating pretty much the same breakfast every day. And then suddenly one day they get a spike out of nowhere. What, what's happened to cause that to happen? Because the bread was the same brand of bread, the same kind of bread, same kind of protein. Everything was the same with breakfast. And then suddenly they're getting highs. What is, what it? Be There's a lot of variables, awesome. cases like that. It could be that the insulin wasn't absorbing as well as it usually does. Maybe it was absorbing late or not at all. Uh, and also be interested to know where they wound up three to four hours later. If you spike after a meal and then come down, that's one thing. If you spike and stay high, it's another thing entirely. Um, so you know, I'd be interested to see a little bit more detail, but you know, this is diabetes. You can't always count on the same results two days in a row. Sometimes I say that the diabetes gods are out to smite us sometimes. It just happens. And I think that what you said is that, you know, if, if you have those occasional days or situations where the sugars are just not where you wanted, it's okay. You know, as long as you're doing a good job most of the time, those occasional excursions are all right. It's not going to you know, do any major damage to you. So. Great. Right. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour and I know you probably have a full day, um, of, you know, meeting and seeing people ahead of you. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we finish on time and I want to thank everyone, um, for, for joining. Ah, someone's asking is think like a pancreas available as an audio book. Yeah, it is. Is well, it? Okay. No, no, I take it back. I tell you it, it's an ebook. I don't know if it's an audio book. It is an ebook though. Okay, I would highly suggest to get the book or the ebook. I don't register information well as a in, in ebooks. I didn't grow up in the digital age. I like paper books. I would highly recommend Think Like a Pancreas in a paper or ebook because there is so much information about understanding the data and things like that. It's not always really kind of like a conversational book because I think it's something you'll want to go back and refer to often. And in an audio book, that would be more difficult and challenging to find. It might be good to listen to it a few times to reinforce it, but if it is, still get still get the paper or ebook is what what I suggest because it's something to be studied, and I don't mean that in the boring kind of way. <laughs> it's great for insomnia. <laughs> no, no. Well, we're we have diabetic children. We don't we don't sleep. It's okay. And nothing is going to put us to sleep. We'll probably stay up and devour it. So thank you all um, so much for, for joining. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you coming to listen to Gary. And Gary, we thank you so much. This was so insightful. Um, like I said, we could talk to you all day. And I hope that you'll come back in the future and share your expertise with, with us again. Um, I, I'd be happy to. Topics. Thank you got, you so you got a great audience here. <laughs> no, thank you. They're, they're very lively and we're always, you know, full of questions. Um, so I'm sure that they'd love to have you back again as well. And we'll be looking forward to your, your Arabic food test very soon. If you need any ideas about what to eat, what people are struggling with, Gary's put his email in the chat. So please drop Gary an email or send it to me and I'll forward it to Gary and, and we'll make some suggestions on challenging Arabic food. Thanks, Pam. All right. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day.